Hey, Christopher here. We are coming up on episode 100 of the Musicality Podcast. Crazy. This has been an incredible journey so far, and I'm truly honored that we've been able to feature some of the world's most impressive and fascinating music educators, delivering powerful insights that can help you do more in your musical life. To celebrate hitting the 100th episode, we wanted to do something special. And as I looked back on all the episodes so far, I thought that what would be most useful would be a way to help you get all the powerful ideas and techniques and strategies from those episodes in one place for easy access. So we've put together a special limited edition collection for you, featuring every single episode, along with a ton of extra resources to help you get the maximum impact on your musical life, plus a bunch of cool bonuses contributed by our amazing guests. This is going to be available for a limited time only, so whether you've just listened to a few episodes or you've been with us since episode one, please check out all the details at musicalitypodcast.com slash celebrate. You won't want to miss this. It's musicalitypodcast.com slash celebrate. Hello, this is Fiona Jane Weston from fionajaneweston.com and you are listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today on the show, I'm excited to be joined by one of London's leading cabaret performers, Fiona Jane Weston. Fiona Jane has created and performed several highly acclaimed cabaret shows in the UK and internationally, including Wartime Women, about the roles women have historically played in warfare, and Looking for Lansbury, celebrating the life, heritage and career of actress Angela Lansbury. Cabaret is a performing art that I've enjoyed, but never really known a ton about, and I was really curious to see what an expert like Fiona Jane might be able to share, since it would likely use musicality in a different way than a performing musician. It definitely lived up to that expectation. There were some really interesting ideas here that I don't think we've talked about on the show before. In this conversation, we talk about what defines cabaret and what makes for good cabaret. We talk about storytelling through song the importance of it both in cabaret and in music more generally. And we talk about connecting with your audience and what we can learn from the uniquely intimate environment of a cabaret show. Something that came out of our discussion that I wasn't expecting was why cabaret might be more accessible to you or any passionate amateur musician than you might have imagined. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Fiona Jane. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk with you because I have enjoyed cabaret as a layperson, but it's not something I know anything about in great depth, and you are someone who knows about it in intimate detail. Uh, So I'm really excited to learn from you. And I, I want to ask first, were you a cabaret performer from day one? Did you leap onto the stage at age six singing cabaret and show tunes? Or what was your earliest musical experience like? Uh, probably it was a bit like that, actually, if I'm really truthful. Um, I, I certainly, as a little girl, wanted to get up and entertain. And I wanted everybody in the, in the house and all the dolls and all the teddies to be listening. And uh, while I got out there and did my little bit with an umbrella, I remember doing a little dance and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, I would also want to recite my poetry, which I called at the age of four, postry. Um, <laughs> so, so I think it was probably always in there. And I do remember looking at old films on the television and seeing these lovely glamorous ladies in their long frocks in um, uh, films set in the 30s and 40s in America and there would be uh, there'd be tables and people would be drinking there and this lady would come out and she would sing and she would address the audience and so on and I think I knew even then yeah <laughs> I'll do that <laughs> Amazing. And what did your early education look like for that? Um, Were you someone who was just natural and went straight into shows and performing? Did you study acting or music along the way? Um, I started dancing quite early, actually, because um, I had a dance teacher come to my school and um, I just found her fascinating to watch. And I just, I don't know, there was something in me that always 
led into that direction. And although I didn't receive any formal music training at all, uh, eventually I persuaded my parents to send me to dance lessons. And the acting came very much later because it, in fact, even with my, my with ballet training, it was clear that I didn't really have the flexibility in my body to do to become a professional dancer. But what I was good at was the character roles and um, the sort of more fiery Spanishy sort of roles, or, or trying to express a story through it, or or. or little Little Red Riding Hood or something like that, where I would actually be wanting to express an emotion. So I think the acting came out of that, recognising that that's really probably where my talent particularly lay. And my parents were very against any, anything to do with that. They didn't want me to go into anything of that of so, that type at all. So I dutifully did my my academic degree, and I, I studied Asian studies actually, and I learned Mandarin. But I wanted to specialise in my thesis. The the arts, the performing arts of China, particularly communist China, and how it was used for propaganda purposes. And then even further, I wanted to look at the the performing arts of the minority peoples and how they were trying to sort of keep up their own identity in the face of, um, well, I wouldn't like to use the word oppression, but I mean, there was the, the Han people were very much in dominance. And so even my university thesis at honours level was about the minority theatres. So it was always there. And although my parents tried desperately hard to keep me in the academic sphere of things, in the end, I think you just have to go where your heart's set. And it's going to, your, it, your natural instincts are going to take you there, whether anybody likes it or not, including yourself, really. <laughs> I've kind of had a love-hate relationship with the profession ever since. <laughs> and so where did your heart lead you after university? You were feeling this draw. How did you pursue that? I started initially doing, um, well, I, I joined the Australian Diplomatic Corps in, in the aid department because um, I was living in Australia at the time. And in Canberra at that time, there was a, a strong amateur theatre scene. And I got involved with that. And my first show was a musical and I was cast in the lead and I was terrified, but I did it. And, and it went well, much to my great surprise at the time. And then that led to this feeling of I've just got to do more and more. And then I started doing professional stuff as well. And things started, well, of course, the two career stars started to clash. And eventually, um, one particularly insightful manager who was from England, actually, he called me into his office and said, look, I gave you an assignment, which is way above your level. And I, I, I confess it, I gave it to you because I was too lazy to do it myself. And I have to say that your historical and political analysis is second to none. Your finance section was a complete mess. And I said, well, I never did say I could add up. And he said, <laughs> look, I have to tell you that you are a square peg in a round hole. You are never going to fit in here. You are never going to rise to the top here, not least because you're female, but also because you're, the way you, you think and the way you, you act the way you respond to things is just not going to work here. I think you should go and do what your heart is set on. And within three weeks, I had packed up my bags and I had left Australia and I came to England in the pursuit of a theatrical career. And that's what I did. I had also, in the meantime, done some training, quite a lot of professional training in Australia, part time. But uh, yeah, that's that's how I did it. Wow, that's <laughs> uh, what a brave and romantic leap you took across the ocean. Well, I don't know if it felt all that romantic at the time. I think I was just very dogged. And I thought, well, you know, I'd had I'd had enough training and experience by then to know that actually I did have something I could offer. And I thought, well, I'm just going to do it because I was miserable working in any other real environment, really. So I thought, well, OK, here it is. Here I go. That's what I did. <laughs> so I came back. I had family here, too. Yeah. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that yeah. training you'd had along the way. Um. Well, I, I took singing lessons professionally. I took, uh, took that very seriously. And um, I kept doing a lot of performance as much as I could get. And being as it was, it was a small town and there weren't that many people, it wasn't such a big pool. I mean, if I'd, if I'd been somewhere like Sydney, it would have been much more difficult, I'm sure. The competition would have been just so much greater. But in, in Canberra then, it was still very much a small town, although it's the capital of Australia. It was kind of the administrative centre. And so I, did, I had a, a lot of experience actually doing it. Plus, I took the singing training, plus I took the acting training. And the acting training didn't cover music, but it very much 
tapped into my instincts that were already there and gave me the technique I needed to be able to approach a character and tap into that creative element, which enables you to uh, improvise and to find where the, where the character lies and also where the, where the inner internal story is. So that set me up in many ways for the approach that I've taken to things ever since. And although my initial degree was in modern Asian studies, it was very much based on history and politics and so on. And so even that was all storytelling. Even that was all about you know, the history of how China became a communist country. And uh, I learned Mandarin. I lived in China for a while. Um, and I became very interested in the women's stories, particularly. I was very interested in women's history anyway because of my training in Australia um, with uh, at school, really. I mean, the Jermaine Greer came from from Queensland, you know, who set up the whole women's movement there and so on. So that was always in there. And I think the whole the whole package of history being a story, whether it's his story or in more modern parlance, we might say her story, if we're talking about women's history, and wanting to tell stories and wanting to entertain, all of that, it all slotted in together. And that was really how it all began. Wonderful. There were a couple of things there that I'm particularly keen to dig into a little bit. And one is what you just touched on, that you have a particular interest and ability in combining the kind of historical viewpoint with the musical, artistic, creative output. And we'll circle back to that in a moment. But the other thing you mentioned was that your training had helped you kind of tap into the character and the story and the emotion that would bring the music to life in a, an effective yeah. way. And that's something I'd really like to hear more about because on this show, we talk a lot about, um, I suppose, expressiveness in music and musically meaningful performances and what distinguishes, you know, a robotic player from one who really seems to have a gift for music and really wows the audience. Yeah. And I think you have a particularly interesting perspective on this because you come maybe more from the acting side than the kind of conservatory musician side of things where the musician might be thinking in notes and scales and dynamics and very kind of technical terms. And you come in at it, I believe, more from the storytelling perspective and that actor's mindset. Yes, yes. Um, I think you tell a story in theatre in so many ways and everything has to tell that story for it to be a successful performance so everybody does whether it's a lighting person whether it's the set designer the costume the director obviously the performers the actors and the music too even the music that doesn't have words attached to it should be lending itself to that story and sometimes interestingly the melody that's played underneath a tune that the, the, the singer might be singing might actually be contradicting what the singer is singing with words. And you hear that very particularly in a lot of Sondheim's music, um, but others too. And that adds a very interesting edge to it. Because, I mean, for example, one, one example I can think of is In Buddy's Eyes. Um, which is from Follies. Now, it's not a song that I've sung, but it's a song I've listened to quite a lot. And it starts off really quite sentimentally, and she's sort of saying, oh, you know, my husband still really loves me, and, you know, even though I'm older, in his eyes, I never get older. You know, I'm, it, he will always be there for me, and so on. And then, as it goes on, you realise that something's not quite right here, and there's something in the accompaniment that suggests... She's either not speaking the truth or she's denying the truth because she can't face it. And if you're listening out for things like that, that's where you know that you're on to something. You're on to something. And that's where the performer, by cluing into things like that, can use the dynamics, can also change the quality of their voice and change the way they're looking at the character they're talking to or moving, that the body language should change too, to sort of indicate, yeah, I'm saying all of these marvellous things, yes, 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 this is really true, but underneath I, I just 
actually, no, I'm in love with you. And I always was. I'm not in love with my husband. <laughs> and that's really what she's saying, really, mm. underneath it. And the marriage has not been successful that she's been living all these years. Interesting. And over those years when you were training, uh, you mentioned training had helped in some regard with this aspect of things. Were there any particular techniques or ideas that helped you figure out how to do that? Because I, I think as you describe it, people can understand the kind of thing you're talking about, but it's it's very different to get up on stage and take ownership of that role and figure that stuff out for yourself, maybe. I don't think I was trained in that. I don't think so. I think that came just simply from an awful lot of listening and an awful lot of thinking and wanting to portray the person. And I was more intent on presenting the person I was trying to become than I was in anything else. And, uh, but because it's music, you can't just change the timing on it completely without any sense. So you do need to be listening to where the music is taking you as well. So rather than fight against that, it's a case of using it. Um, but having said that, depending on the genre, particularly with cabaret and particularly with anything jazz orientated, obviously, you can play with the, the, the rhythms and the tempo in order to express an idea in a different way, as long as you don't go completely out of sync with one another. Um, and I, that sort of thing I learned through experience and also through working with musical directors who understood what I was trying to do. And were able, we were able to have that kind of conversation whereby they were to some extent able to follow me, but also I was learning to listen to them. So I think it's about listening a lot and it's about communication. Um, and I wouldn't say that it came through any particularly, any through any of my formal training at all. Certainly some acting through songs workshops that I've attended. Some of this has been touched on. Um, and particularly musical theatre performers, they often are looking for expressive ways to doing it. And then incidentally, a lot of musical theatre performers don't read music or don't read music very well. Um, so there's something in the way in which we are taught to think like that. And if you can, if you're working with actors, I would strongly recommend that if, if you can get the actor to think about motivations and feelings, they will probably breathe at the right points in any case, even if they can't read a note. Fascinating. I, I think it's such a valuable lens to think about all of this through because thinking now about the listener who maybe plays an instrument but doesn't do any acting and doesn't think in terms of theatre, it's such a powerful mindset shift to actually ask yourself, like, what is this music trying to say? Not just am I playing the right notes at the right times and obeying the dynamic markings, but what am I trying to get across to the audience? You know, I look back somewhat um, embarrassedly at when I was learning clarinet or saxophone and I, I was playing one of the movements from Mazorsky's pictures from an exhibition, right? And this is a, a work of music composed around visual art. It's each around a painting. And I literally never saw the painting. I, I worked for months on this piece and it never occurred to me. I could go and, and find out what this was inspired by and what he was trying to conjure up. And looking back, that just seems ridiculous. But I think it's so easy as musicians to get trapped in that bubble of dots on a page or just the notes and the technique. And we forget that it is a storytelling art to a large extent, or it can be. And, and we should always be asking that question of, you know, what am I trying to convey or express? Yes, yes. I don't think musicians are the only ones who are, are guilty of that either. I think actually a lot of dancers are. Um, it becomes such um, an exercise in gymnastic technique and, and that it's there is a danger that you, you're not going to move anybody, that you're not – because really a dancer too is telling a story through their movement and through their whole feeling and embodiment of, of, of the emotion of the time. Uh, I think it's very important not to lose sight of that. There's an audience out there. This isn't an exercise in self-indulgence. It's important to be able to do that. But also, to be fair, not, not all music uh, is, is easily lent to, to, to doing that. Um, again, Stephen Sondheim is no, notoriously difficult. Everybody knows that you know, his rhythms are very, very tricky. It's often very fiddly. Um, it can take a long time to learn his stuff. But I tell you what, actors who have never read a note of music adore doing his things 
And there's a reason for that. The reason is really that he he writes so well for a character. He's actually thinking what the character's thinking. And therefore, these strange, odd little um, moments of pauses uh, and rests that came in the middle of a line are actually there for a dramatic reason. And uh, I was taught, I, I mean, I've, I've sung quite a lot of... Uh, a number of times now, Worst Pies in London. I only had one lesson to learn how to do that because I could only see this particular vocal coach for one lesson for one hour. And what she did was help me to sort of see what the character, well, that part of it I could I could work out for myself, where the character might have been, what the character's feeling in different sections of the song. But in order to help me get some of these odd rhythms, she also got me to go, Mm, or clap or stamp my foot or do something where something strange was about to happen so that I didn't sing the notes where I thought I should be singing the notes, but rather where I'm mm, da, 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 um, trying to think how it goes now. Wait, what's your rush? What's your hurry? You gave me such a <gasps> fright. I thought you was a ghost. I've come in. That, so that <gasps> so I thought you were a ghost. Is it, you've got to have that, that thing there. And I thought, well, actually, if she's thinking about a ghost, she might do that little intake of breath and so by doing it in that mechanical way she got me to speak it and put some kind of sound or or intake of loud intake of breath in where these strange pauses were and then but by going over that and getting that into my body I suddenly found all of the dramatic reasons to do it and sometimes is brilliant for that absolutely wonderful so we've abandoned the poor young Fiona Jane <laughs> midway across the ocean on her way back to London where did things go from there when you were returning to this, um, well, maybe not returning to, but you were starting afresh a new career direction for you and a new purpose in life? Uh, well, it took a few years to really kind of establish where I was really, apart from anything else, because I didn't know London at all. And uh, so just just trying to sort of get settled, although I did get a job within a year. In fact, it was a few months uh, after arriving here, I got a job with a theatre, a children's theatre going around. And again, music was part of that as well. Um, and then <laughs> I got a job in a cabaret, uh, not a cabaret, sorry, in a, in a pantomime where I, oh dear, this is cringe making. <laughs> I um, I played the, the the maid that got to marry the handsome prince, and in the meantime, the handsome prince and I actually uh, became romantically entangled off stage as well as on, and then of course I settled, <laughs> and he was an actor as well. So that's really where you know, obviously that's you know that then grounded me here. Um, and I just took things as they came along. I took as many um, classes as I could in professional theatre because there, you can do that in London. I mean, in places like City Lit, where a, a professional level you could actually go in. And also there was a, a marvellous um, singing teacher for actors that came in from America. His name was Chuck Colson. And he was he was fabulous. He would say to us as a bunch of actors, because there were there were actors there who were terrified of singing, terrified that they sang out of tune and all sorts of things. I loved it. But they were they were scared of doing it, which is why they came to that class. And he would say things that would just liberate them to be who they were. And and we got to write down the words and to learn the words quite separately from the music so that we could bring all our acting instincts to that as we might to a piece of poetry. And then he would just say things like, the audience don't care if you had to splash this about 37 times before you got that line right. It doesn't matter. Look, the audience don't care and neither does Chuck. <laughs> and I learned from that. It doesn't matter how many times you had to learn to sing that song. As long as you, when you get in there, you're fine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And at some point in this journey, Cabaret entered the picture and became a real focus for you. How did that come to be? Um, well, I got to an age where I was not getting the amount of work that I had been getting. And I wasn't quite in the next age bracket, so that I was in this kind of slightly awkward in between part. And I got very fed up with not getting any work. And um, so I went to become, uh, I actually took my PGCE and I became a primary school teacher. And I realized within about 10 minutes that this was a bit of a mistake, actually. <laughs> Although I enjoyed teaching young children, I 
didn't enjoy the restrictions of the whole system and so on. And I just thought, oh, gosh, now I can't, I, you know, this is not going to keep me satisfied at all. And within a couple of years, um, I had to stop anyway because I'd become ill over something. And I'd, um, uh, I had to stop for a while to get some sick leave. And in that time, I took that time to rethink what I was doing. And I took the exams to become a teacher in uh, the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, the Lambda exams, to become a Lambda teacher, as well as do my ballet exam teaching as well. And uh, in the and those, it's changed now, but at that time, you had to choose an entire century of the drama and the uh, the prose and the poetry of a century. So you, you might be able to choose um, the Elizabethan era or the Greeks. And like an idiot, I chose 20th century because I thought, well, I know all the drama content already pretty well. And my teacher did say to me, she said, look, I understand why you might like the idea of taking the 20th century, but you do realize that was the one where everybody could read and write. And it's a vast amount of work. And you do have a lot of gaps in your, uh, your poetry and prose. Well, I still did it like a fool and I managed to get through it. But one of the parts of that exam was after you had done your viva about all of the knowledge behind it, you then had to give a 20 minute presentation where you had to include a piece of poetry, a piece of drama, and a piece of um, prose from that era. And you can include more than one piece, but it all had to be linked in some way. That became the basis. I did actually a piece on 20th century women and the, the progression that the women had made throughout that century. That then then became the basis for my first one-woman show. And I took the idea to a director, a good friend of mine. We worked on it. And I created this cabaret with him and uh, put it on at the Battersea Barge. And then not long after that, I got an opportunity to audition for Yale, um, Yale University. There was a, um, a cabaret intensive course going on there that was, in, that was uh, loosely related to the drama department there. And I got a scholarship, much to my great surprise. So I knew I had to go because, I mean, you know, it was there was no excuse then. I had to do it. And... There were amazing people on teaching us. I mean, just amazing people. Uh, do you know the rose, uh, Amanda McBroom? Some say love, it is a river. Anyway, it was one of the most famous songs from the time. I bet Midler had a big hit with it. The woman who wrote that, Amanda McBroom, was on the uh, on the course. There was um, people that were very well known in America, including uh, Tony Award winners and people that someone like Tova Felchu and Sally Mays and, and oh, all sorts of very well known people there teaching us. And they were their whole intents and purpose was to get us to sing the songs, tell the story through the song and actually make the cabaret to actually, you know, encourage us in how to make a cabaret happen. And I came away from that realizing that I not only knew what I was talking about already with cabaret, but more to the point, I knew what I knew what I was talking about if that makes sense. Suddenly I had the confidence to realize I, I do know about this. This is actually always what I've been working towards. And then that started off a whole lot of other shows. And I had all of this creativity going on and I just, it's been a game changer. It really has. From then I've always had a project that I've been wanting to do and perform. And it's taken me all over the place. It's taken, uh, I do one on wartime women, looking at the roles women have played throughout warfare, but concentrating mainly on, the, on the, the Great Wars. And that's taken me to Belgium and so on. And so I still do plays. I still get work in the theatre, but mostly I concentrate on my cabaret career. Terrific. And I'm going to ask on behalf of maybe some of our listeners who aren't familiar, what is cabaret before we talk more in depth about it? Oh, gosh, that is not an easy question to answer, actually. Um, because it has so many meanings for so different, it's such a wide umbrella. Um, on one end of the scale, you've got very much what I call the alternative scene with the burlesque um, and uh, circus training and so on. And more at the other end, a much more sort of, uh, if you like, a more classical, what I would call songbook cabaret, is people singing. And the important thing about that is that unlike a concert, where there's a distance between you and the audience, and unlike a musical where you are completely embodying a character, it is you 
singing to the audience and expressing your ideas and emotions to the audience, breaking down what we might call the fourth wall. So in a theatre, you've got the three walls around you, the left, the right and behind you. And then there's supposed to be an invisible fourth wall between you and the audience so that if you're a character, you're staying in your living room, you're not actually supposed to be aware of the audience out in front. In cabaret, we break that completely down and you are very much talking to the audience themselves. They are very much part of that. It's a small, intimate setting. People are sitting around tables, drinking, ordering drinks from the bar. Um, you can address people in the audience. I've been addressed from stage, you know, say, oh, Fiona Jane Wesson's in, right? And they have a little chat and they come around and, um, you know, you can go around and have a little flirt with people and so on. It's, 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 it, it, and then you go back onto the stage and then you will sing something else that even you're telling something through that, not only through the songs, but hopefully some kind of theme, not to the point where you get completely caught up in it necessarily, but it's, you've got so much more scope to take it in a new direction. So you might take a song that was originally written for a, a show, perhaps, and then you can change it to suit that new occasion where it's telling a different story. And you might want to express a different emotion through it and bring something very new to that and sing it in your own voice and in your own way because you're expressing another idea with that. And rather like when you go to an art gallery, you will look at a painting, but if it's placed next to another painting, it will have a different aspect to it that you hadn't thought of because of where it's placed. So that's a very long answer, but that's the sort of things you need to be thinking about if you're going to put together a show yourself. It's not just a case of this is a song by whoever and this is another song I like because, and because I like it, I'm going to sing it. it. Really, ideally, you want to have something a little bit more concrete in your reasoning for choosing the piece and for singing it to the audience. I see. Does that and help? <laughs> it, it does. Wonderful description, and I think it really highlights what we were talking about before and the importance both of remembering you have an audience and you need to connect with them and this idea of weaving a story through your songs. I think it's, it's immediately clear now why Cabaret connected with you so much if those were the things you were feeling drawn to and, and feeling you were good at. So just a quick clarification. You mentioned another term people might have heard, which is one woman show. Is mm -hmm. Cabaret always a solo endeavor where it's one person presenting the entire performance or how does it work? Uh, it generally is, but it doesn't have to be at all. Um, there are various ways you can do it. I mean, there are duos that um, get up and, and do you know, a piece together as, as, as a duet together, usually one, some kind of semi-comedic situation. Um, I, you, you could effectively do it with a larger group as well, depending on how it's structured, really, as much as anything else. Certainly, I mean, I have another form of a cabaret too, which is uh, Fiona Jane and West End Friends. And I run it rather like a chat show, so that I open the set with a couple of songs myself and then explain to the audience what the concept of that is. And I bring on uh, guest artists and they might be a West End performer. They might also be a musical director or a choreographer who might have something else to share that some other uh, perspective on the business. I will also always have a cabaret singer if I can. And I will entertain them i'll give them a cup of tea or a drink or a cocktail and we'll sit down at the table and we'll chat together about their projects and what they are doing and then they get up and do something um, so they can show something of their work and if it's a, a musical director who doesn't want to sing they might bring another guest artist and so everybody gets a chance to network but and then you might i i might have as many as seven or eight people at some point joining me on stage so it doesn't have to be a solo thing so if somebody is a bit afraid of doing that Join forces with somebody else who wants to do it. Get in a director. Get someone else who, who can help you, um, preferably somebody who understands the genre. But it's, it, you don't have to be completely on your own, especially if you're, want, if you're starting out and you're not sure how to go about it. There, are, there is help out there, and you don't have to perform by yourself all the time. Wonderful. So I'd like to circle back to something I said I would come back to, which was that you are particularly able and known for weaving together historical themes or kind of real life 
matter of fact issues like women in the 20th century or you did one uh, cabaret show on the history and maybe mythology of London and I mm-hmm. I would love to hear more about that because I think you touched on feeling drawn to do all of this and you know you said you were never short of projects now that you had found kind of your medium and I I, I know that if I were feeling inspired to say put on a show about London I would immediately feel very intimidated because it's such a big thing and it's something (laughs) everyone's going to have an opinion on and compared to you know sitting in my bedroom and writing a love song out of nowhere it it can seem I think quite quite intimidating or quite um, overwhelming so I'd love to hear how you found your way into that and and any advice you'd have for someone who is feeling similarly inspired, but maybe can't see the route from that inspiration to actually putting something together? Um, well, London, the London show was, was <laughs> yeah, that was pretty vast, actually. I mean, 2,000 years of London in less than two hours was, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a bit of pressure there. So much written about it in, for the performing arts. I mean, all of the music hall material for a start. You've also got... Um, Samuel Pepys's diary. I mean, I, I used some of that. Uh, not everybody can do spoken word, but I I loved bringing in spoken word for mine. Um, there is poetry written about London. There, um, all sorts of anecdotes people have, have had to say about it. Songs about London. Find all of the things that you love about whatever it is that you want to talk about. Sift through it. Throw them all on the floor, and then move them about like a pack of cards. All right. And then decide, start to shape your show from that. There are various techniques that you can use to do that. Um, you can look entirely at the I would or I would always suggest that you start with the lyrics as much as anything else. Start with the lyrics because you might find that you will see a story naturally emerging. Then shuffle your cards around again and see where something comes from that. Then think about where the musical highlights are where the comedic highlights are where you're going to be doing something different are you going to be bringing on a guest artist Uh, and then slowly a shape will emerge and then you'll have something far too long and you'll have to cut a million things out and the art as within a lot of these things is in what you keep in and what you cut out and it's quite difficult and sometimes it takes more than one performance for you to realize you know what that bit's still too long I'm going to have to cut this or that. Or I might bring that that bit back in that I thought I would cut. Um, Don't be afraid to experiment in front of people. Don't be afraid to get in a test audience. And slowly it will come together, but it will come together and it will be the most satisfying thing you've ever done. (laughs) You touched on something there that I don't think we'd talked about yet, which is that spoken word can be a feature of it. You know, cabaret is not just singing song after song, or at least not necessarily. And and there are other things people should keep in mind as what could be a part of their cabaret show. Yes. If you're a good instrumentalist and you've got something you can do with that, do it. Um, There is a chap in, in the States, in New York, I saw him. Can't remember his name. I can't tell you it. But he does a whole cabaret with his violin. And he tells, in, in a way, he makes musical jokes with the violin. Um, and again, you know, if you've got a musical director with you, if you've got a pianist with you who is a bit of a showman, use that. Use that. If you can have some kind of rapport with the person who's accompanying you, use that. Don't let anybody just sit there. Uh, uh, there are if you've got other talents that you want to bring to the fore, I mean, a friend of mine is very, very good at comedic things and she brings in a lot of her, her comedic work to it. Use, use whatever you want to, to express those, those aspects of yourself because cabaret is about being, being you on stage. Even if it's a persona you've created, it, it, you've got that freedom to do that. And also it's what people want. People want to connect with you. It's much more personal than it would be if you were doing a concert that's got a big distance between you. People want to feel somehow that they've got to know the essence of you by watching your show. So, yes, anything that you have that's a passion, that's an interest, bring something of that in, definitely. It's a case of structuring it. Mm, yeah. Well, I... I think what has come across clearly to me that I was maybe 
not fully appreciative of before is the careful thought and planning that goes into a good cabaret show. And I think that's maybe a little bit because that word is bandied about a lot. You know, you alluded to there being this whole spectrum. But I think there are also probably a lot of things called cabaret that maybe are not really. Uh, you know, for example, I, I've definitely come across cases where it's really used to mean talent show and we'll get mm. a group of a dozen people, we'll let them each do the song they know or the juggling act they can do. We'll put it all together in one performance and call it a cabaret. Yeah. And I think what's really come across from hearing you talk about this is that it is much more intentional and the fact that there is a casual atmosphere by no means means that it's a casual act that you throw together. You know, there can be intense thought and planning and preparation that goes into it. Yes, yes, yeah. And also, I I personally don't like it if the performers themselves are too casual in the way they dress or depending on their act. I mean, you know, obviously it may not always apply, but generally speaking, I think that when people come to a cabaret of this type, they want to see something glamorous. They want to see something that's going to take them out of the world. It might be a girl's night out. It might be very important to them. You might be taking you, you, you know, your mother out for something. It's, this should be a dress up occasion. It should be um, something that people really look forward to. Don't let your audience down. Don't go in there dressing like you would to go to the shops. You know, really make the effort. This is a this is a, a form of theatre in its own way. Lift people out of where they are. That's our job. That's what we're meant to do. That's why we're here. That's what performance is all about. That's what that's. I mean, as my doctor once said to me, he said. We don't need any more accountants. <laughs> we don't need people like that. We need people like you who get up and entertain. <laughs> so, <laughs> so get up and entertain. Be a star that shines. <laughs> and I love that, you know, what I just said somewhat disparagingly about talent shows, there is a, a kernel of truth there, which you talked about, which is that, you know, it is an expression of yourself and your own abilities and your own passions. And I think that makes it a very versatile art form. You know, it's not you having to force yourself into a certain role or a whole work of music or theater and, you know, doing it exactly as written. This is something that you craft yourself to match what you are naturally strongest at and passionate about. I mean, I, I have a couple of German friends who bring the most interesting perspective on their cabaret. They really do. Because, of course, Germany has a very fine tradition in it with Weimar. Um, and watching what they can do with their pieces and what they bring their own history and their own family history into that is, is great. It really is. So you, you, there's, there's so many things. And it, go to yourself. Go to your own story and see what you can bring out. That will that will be, and people will find it interesting because they're interested in other people's lives apart from their own. Well, I I have to say, it had never occurred to me that cabaret could be as accessible a form of expression as you have made it sound. You know, this sounds like <laughs> something that anyone who's done a bit of singing or done a bit of music and has a passion for a particular topic could put together themselves. Are, are there any caveats or any pointers you'd give to someone who's been listening to this and feeling super excited about maybe putting a cabaret together themselves? Um, I would say definitely try, definitely go for it, um, because um, I think you'll get a lot of pleasure from it. Um, Keep an eye on where you're going to perform it. And remember, by and large, the space that you have physically is likely to be very small. So uh, don't put in a whole great big dance number that requires a, long, a, a big stage because you ain't going to have the room. So by all means, if you're a dancer and you want to show that, you can. Uh, uh, there are people who do that. But you just remember how small and tight the space is going to be. So a lot of your expression has to be made within that space. Um, remember that you are including people in the audience. That If some rooms are very strangely set up and it's difficult to connect with everybody in that audience, practice that in your in your rehearsals. Um, I do think it's a good idea to work with the director if you can. Um, work with somebody who who is good at sitting out the front and be able to sort of see where things might improve. Watch the structure of your work and... If you remember, this is a long show. If you're doing it on your own, make sure you're vocally ready for it because actually you can't take a break in the way that you could if you were in a musical where you might be off stage for 10 minutes. No, you're not going to be off stage for 10 minutes apart from if you set an interval. And even then, that probably means you've got a longer show. So, yeah, your, your technicality still has to be there. You can't let 
that just all go to pieces just because you want to be expressive. You'll be more expressive if you've got the technique behind you. Great advice. You seem to be someone who not only has a real passion for cabaret and producing your own shows, but also I, I think you, you clearly have a, a kind of advocate spirit in you. You want uh, to encourage people to get involved in this. What are you up to these days? What is Fiona Jane Weston working on and what's coming next? Uh, I'm about to do a, a version of Fiona Jane Weston, uh, sorry, Fiona Jane and West End Friends in a private club in, a, in, in the city. That's going to be in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in Later in the year, because of Remembrance Sunday coming up again, I'm doing a... Um, a big charity gala in the Charing Cross Theatre, which I'm co-producing with a lady from Belgium, where there's going to be all sorts of uh, stars from the West End involved in it as well. And that's going to be uh, the proceeds of which will go to people like Combat Stress and the British Legion and so on. Uh, so that's on October the 28th. Then I hope to do some more of Wartime Women, because it's always such a fun show to do as well, uh, both in Belgium and in London. And I also hope to revive another show I've done on, on uh, the actress Angela Lansbury. So I've got a whole big show on, on her, and that would be nice to be able to bring that out. And also, I hope to launch some kind of consultancy for people who want to do cabaret or want to do their own one-woman shows or one-man shows, even if it doesn't involve music, if I can be of help to anybody, they're welcome to contact me. That would be absolutely fine. Get hold of me through my website. <laughs> Wonderful. And I'm sure it, it's clear from listening to this conversation that you would have a wealth of experience and wisdom to, to share with someone who is at that beginner stage or even further along in their cabaret journey. So where's the best place for people to go to learn all about your upcoming shows and to get in touch if they'd like to for help with cabaret? Okay, go to www.fionajane.com western.com it's all one word Fiona Jane Western it takes forever to type um, and then at the bottom of the, each page there is a, a contact page there there's also a little envelope if you press that I hope it works um, you should be able to get up a form where you can sign up to my newsletter list and that's where you will know where I'm performing and when but also that you know there's Somewhere around all of that is, is an email address for you. But in fact, the email address is the same. It's, it's just Fiona Jane at Fiona Jane Weston dot com. Um, contact me there and I'd be very I'd be delighted to hear from you because, uh, you know, I'd love to know what you're doing, what your projects are and what what's what floats your boat. What, what, what makes you want to do a cabaret? Wonderful. Thank you. Well, it, it really has opened my eyes and my mind to what cabaret involves and what it can involve. And I, I'm absolutely in no position to run off and produce a cabaret, but I can't help <laughs> but feel that I want to right now. <laughs> so you clearly, you clearly I'll have a, you a, a, <laughs> maybe after this uh, conversation, we'll turn off the recorder and we can talk some cabaret ideas. Um, <laughs> it, it's been really no, genuinely inspiring. And I think also enlightening, you know, whether or not someone's going away from this wanting to produce a cabaret, there is clearly a ton that any musician can learn from the world of theatre and from the world of cabaret. So just a very big thank you, Fiona Jane, for joining us today and sharing some of your insights on this. Thank you very much. I've loved it. <laughs> thank you so much. Unlock your full musicality with Musical You membership. Find out more at musicalitypodcast.com forward slash join. Well, you could probably hear it in my voice there but I finished up that interview a lot more fired up about cabaret than I expected to be. There were several really interesting lessons there, I think, apart from the general message that cabaret might be an art form worth you exploring further. Let's do a quick recap. Fiona Jane was naturally drawn to performance, putting on shows and reciting poetry as a child, but she was drawn away from that natural inclination into the world of academic studies. However, even there, she took the opportunity to focus her work on the arts where possible, and was continually doing training and taking part in shows on the side. She kept that passion alive until bravely taking the leap to move country and career and become an actor in London. Two themes which jumped out hearing Fiona Jane talk about her theatre training were storytelling through song and the importance of connecting with your audience, and there's definitely a link between those two. We talked a bit about how easy it is as a musician or a dancer to be so absorbed in the technicalities of your craft that you forget there is meant to be a story being told. Actors are by necessity more in touch with this, and I thought it was fascinating to hear Fiona Jane talk about approaching songs and how taking an actor's perspective on the lyrics before thinking about the dots on a page or the musical technicalities 
can bring clarity and power to your performance. She gave a couple of examples where the lyrics might be telling one story and the music another, or where looking purely at the sheet music might result in you totally missing the point or really struggling with the musical content. She did note that music isn't always necessarily about storytelling in this way, but if it is, or it can be, this is clearly a really valuable mindset shift to make. This is a simple but powerful thing you can take away from this episode. Simply ask yourself with each piece you practice or perform, what's the story being told here, and am I conveying that through how I play? We talked about dynamics and rhythm as two aspects of a performance which you can play with to find that expression. But of course there are endless possibilities, as Fiona Jane's gasp of surprise to fill in a rest in a tricky Sondheim rhythm clearly demonstrated. The second theme was connecting with your audience. And in the world of cabaret, where you might be just feet away from them, or literally walking among them, the importance of this can't be overlooked. Again, for a musician playing mostly at home, absorbed in the music, it's easy to forget this. But whether your audience is out in front of you as you play on a stage, or they're surrounding you drinking beers at a cabaret, or indeed if you are your own audience playing music at home, don't forget to perform it in a way that will move the audience, and be sure to listen carefully to yourself to make sure you're having the musical effect you intend to. I thought it was interesting that Fiona Jane said listening was the key thing which helped her to learn to do these two things, to tell a story through music and to connect with her audience. It wasn't specific techniques or methods she was taught, but the art of listening carefully to what's happening in the music and opening your mind to be aware of the context and the possibilities and the meaning beneath it all. We talked specifically about cabaret and how there's a spectrum of what that word means, from burlesque and circus acts through to more classical theatre performance. It can also be misused to mean loosely a talent show or a variety show. Ideally, though, it should have a clear theme or narrative that binds it all together. And the examples of Fiona Jane's own shows make that clear, I think, with one on Angela Lansbury, one about women's history in the 20th century, and another all about the city of London. I loved how quick she was to encourage us all to consider cabaret as a versatile way to express something we're passionate about. It would be easy, I think, to feel intimidated or overwhelmed, particularly when confronted by the idea of staging a one-person show on a vast and important topic. But hearing her talk about it, it's clear that the art form is far more flexible and accessible than all that. She explained how cabaret is about expressing your own abilities and passions. So in a way, it's actually far more accommodating than putting on a performance of somebody else's opus or musical or show. You can focus on the things that resonate with you and draw from the skills you already have and want to share. That means it's much more within reach to create your own cabaret than many other forms of creative performance. I so enjoyed talking with Fiona Jane and learning more about the art of cabaret and I genuinely found myself excited about what cabaret can be, both as an audience member and as a performer. If you felt similarly inspired, then please do visit her website, fionajaneweston.com, that's W-E-S-T-O-N weston.com. Sign up for her email list, where you'll get info on her performances around the world, and you can also contact her through the website there if you'd like any input on pursuing cabaret yourself, or indeed just to tell her that you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening to this episode, and stay tuned for our next one, where I'll be picking up on something that Fiona Jane and previous guest Marshall MacDonald both talked about, and that's the power and usefulness of thinking in terms of songs and lyrics, even as an instrument player. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners.